there, I wanted to jump into your uh, subsequent work. Uh, we we got to talk about that some. So it took you a while, but in 96, I think you came out with your first one lover silhouette, right? So what, what took so long? And uh, tell me about the experience of putting together a record like that. Well, you know, first of all, I've been on the road since I was a kid. And so I was actually relieved that it was kind of over now that I can, you know, just settle down. I remember my wife, Louisa, looking at me going, gee, are you going to choke because you're eating so fast? <laughs> like, yeah, that's right. Leonard Smith, you know, Leonard's a big guy, you know. Come on, man, come on, man. The bus is waiting. And me and Maurice, we're still there trying to finish our breakfast or something. So you get used to eating fast, and walking fast, and fast, fast, fast. So first of all, I was, again, so blessed to meet and get with my wife. This year, it's unbelievable. It's going to be 37 freaking years. And it, it certainly doesn't seem like it. Yeah. But uh, just an amazing change in my life with a very rounded woman, a beautiful woman inside and out, and a woman of God. For, I mean, just unbelievable. I call her church lady. And the moment we got together, she was just so supportive. And then I heard her singing, I'm like, really? And then she's a great uh, vocalist and great songwriter, great writer. She writes these gorgeous melodies that the world can sing. And, um, and so, you know, like I said, we started writing almost immediately. And, uh, and from there, we started putting those commercials for Japan, which was just so much fun. And so I was just, you know, we were cool. And then finally, we went to Japan together because I had been many times, but she hadn't. And our good buddy Hiroto Kobayashi introduced us to this young guy that was brilliant. He worked for Kumon Institute, which they have all over the world now. Mr. Kumon himself took Luisa and I and Toru to a fugu restaurant. You know what that is, right? I've heard of it. What, what is it again? Blowfish. And ah. it's not prepared properly. You it's poisonous. Die. Yeah. You die. It was unbelievable. And, uh, but it was such a small portion that the president of our record company, who was under under uh, Mr. Kuman, who didn't he didn't care about eating. As soon as we left there, and it was twenty four hundred dollars for the four of us. We went, and Mr. Kuman went his way, and Taru, Luis, and I went to a famous little uh, ramen noodle place on the corner in Osaka, and ate our faces off. Finished eating. I was finished when we left that place. But anyway, Mr. Kuman, uh, he passed away, but he has these higher things of learning for people, for kids. And Toru Hashimoto worked for him. And his job was supposed to extend for three years or four years or something, but he was so brilliant, he completed everything. And his mission was done in only two years. So Mr. Kuman asked him, what, what do you really want to do? And he said, I'd like to open a record company. So he did. And so we're in Japan and Hiroto introduced us to him. And I would get, hey, gave him a cassette that had a few tunes on it that Luis and I had done. He was like, beautiful. And so we had a deal and he said, there's one thing, just make sure you feature your wife on at least one song like my wife. Well, I think we can do that. <laughs> and let's exclude her. And so we did that and he was gorgeous. He Gave us a real nice budget. Didn't get his nose all still. Do this and do that. Did like you said, just make sure you feature your wife on at least one song. So we did it, and Al played on it. Um, I let Ralph and Marcel East write us a tune, Enchanted. Uh, Ralph and I wrote Between Seven and Earth, featured Ronnie Laws. Uh, it was it was. Yeah, my book. Stephen did most of the drums. Ralph played on his song, two songs. And but that was 1992. So then, and, took a while uh, to get here, huh? Took a while to get to. Uh, these know, actually, you know what? It never really did get here because we got the, this company that turned out to be some crooked crooks. And one of my sisters in Denver had called me and said, 
somebody's selling your album over in Australia or somewhere twenty thirty six dollars. I'm like, really? Yeah, but what was funny about that though is that I did a remake to the Japanese president of the company uh, invited us after we finished to come back to Japan and promote the album. And he said, well, you know, I'm going to do this little tour. Well, just me and Louisa, me with keyboards and a dad tape. And Louisa sang the two songs she sang. And he's like, it'd be great if you did a couple of Earth, Wind & Fire songs. So two days we did, killed it. Fantasy and Let's Groove. Let's Groove was me and Ronnie. And then, all, and then the, the, the company over here, like, in 96, they said, yeah, that's, that'd be great. The only problem is that we got to deal with the sampling. I said, excuse me? This, I said, no, Uncle Larry does not sample. Larry is the sample. What about Maurice and Philip Paul? I said, no, no. All those vocals is Louisa and Carl Carwell, our other buddy that Philip and I grew up with in Denver. Another singing mofo. And they're like, get out. I said, no, that, that, that's all them. And it was it was just funny to me. It's like the only problem we're gonna have is dealing with the sampling. There was no sampling. So that was '96, and they never really we never finished the deal with them. So they really had no uh, authority to release it. And that's when they released it. Uh, Larry Dunn, Lover Silhouette, The Fire. That was all the legal crap. And I talked to a couple of my great attorneys. They were like. You know what? All we all we would do is just put a cease and desist, and they'll just you know you know how it goes. They'll just move it somewhere else, and, and you know and you're wasting twenty five hundred dollars retainer. I said, okay, good, leave it alone. Mm -hmm. And then so did that, and people really took to it. Great, you know, uh, Phil Upchurch, you know, just great, great musicians. And then uh, you know, time passed. We were still doing commercials, and then finally uh, into the journey. Yeah, yeah, which I don't want to have here. There you go. Uh, Louisa writing, producing, singing. Stephen Dunn, my kid brother, did most of the drum work, but we were so blessed. Ricky Lawson, before he passed, and played on it. Uh, Beloit Taylor, before he passed, because we worked on it seven years. Then I got Stanley Clark, Ronnie Laws, Hubert Laws, James Ingram, Manyango from Stevie's band, Paulinho da Costa. Oh my God. Mm, let me kiss myself. No. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, I said Foley, yeah, from Miles Band. Uh, I told her, we got enough people on there to make a Tarzan movie. You uh, got a great, a great uh, supporting cast, man. I mean, who could ask for better? The music, musician, I remember Louis Satterfield told me years ago, he said, Duh, man, in Africa, the musician, the magician, and the physician was all the same cat. <laughs> so, but yeah, that was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, I, I, even my, myself, I was surprised how well it came out. Stevie Wonder actually called me and Louisa and let us know how much he loved uh, my rendition of Reasons. Mm -hmm. And then actually came out on Louisa's birthday a couple of years ago. We were performing in the waterfront and sat in, got on stage and sang his version of Happy Birthday to her. And we were, everybody was in shock. How many years ago was that? God. I think it was like four years or five years ago. Yeah, he's absolutely one of my mentors. When I was like 12 years old, listening to my Sharia more, I didn't have no girlfriend, but it made you want a girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> the first the first record I ever got that was not, you know, like, the first one I ever got was probably like Partridge Family. But after that, the first one I ever got through my sister who was working for uh, Epic Records at the time, was fulfilling his first finale. Huge Stevie fan for life after that. Uh, when we first started talking some months back, I wasn't up on the new record and you gave me a copy. Thanks for that. So I've listened quite a bit and I wanted to give you a little feedback as long as we're talking here. So, uh, so should I bring her in now? Might as well. How are you doing today? I'm doing excellent. Mr. Goldfine. And having a great conversation with your husband. Well, let me do a proper intro. So we're joined here by Louisa, Larry's wife of 37 years. Sorry. Yes. 14th, it will be so. Yes, wow. 37 years. Amazing. Wow. Goes by like that, right? It goes fast. It's funny. When people see her, they go, she doesn't even look 30. <laughs> I said, that's because I've given her a stress-free life. She said, 
Um, <laughs> but then I came up with, I took a good one that all husbands should use. If you have a wife like this, I said, she works like the Jamaicans on the living. So I got 10 jobs, man, and another one on a height. But uh, I, told, I said, this is the husband's golden card. She has so much to do taking care of me and everything else. She just doesn't have the time to age. Oh, isn't now you go downstairs, special. you tell your wife that and see what happens tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't believe her age, but she, she said, when people ask her how old she, what she is, what do you say? Plenty ones. <laughs> Plenty ones plenty, with an S. Plenty. Plenty ones. Okay, I like that. That'll get a hold of you. Yeah. Plenty ones. Yeah, plenty ones. That works. Yeah, that works. So anyway, yes, yeah, so we're, we're, now we're up to, I was telling him about uh, Lover Silver. And about. actually, another one of her gifts is yeah. she, she also comes up with the title. She came up with Lover Silhouette. And she came up with not just Into the Journey, because she said she's a fashionista and she, you know, she, she got 10 jobs in. She said, no, I don't want it just like the word in, into the journey. She said, I want like an Einstein looking font or something. So she came up with just the letter N, then the number two, the journey. And I said, wow, you go, girl. <laughs> well, I've been enjoying listening to it, uh, you know, and it's got great variety and what an incredible supporting cast like we've been talking about. Just the musicianship, superb all throughout. Um, you know, I have a lot of favorites, but I, it really gets off to a great start. Feeling free um, is a great start, and that's one of my favorites. Wow. I feel like you really wear your, your Earth, Wind, and Fire heritage on your sleeve on this one. And I, I don't know if that's the intention or not. I figure it is because you have a cover of Reasons on there. But, I mean, listening to it, anyone who knows Earth, Wind, and Fire is going to connect the dots even if they didn't know who did this. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Jay King from Club Nouveau, who actually works with us on a lot of levels, management, different stuff. He's like, when he first heard, he said, man. And he plays on his radio show all the time. He's like, you guys, this is Larry Dunn. And it's featuring his wife, Louise, on there. And actually, uh, we wrote that a long time ago. It was Sheldon Reynolds, Foley, and myself. We are just in the studio. And we just threw it down. And then, uh, you know, but yeah, that absolutely. Then we put the horns on it, and it uh, it stinks good of Earth, Wind, and Fire. Yes, it? yes, yes. It's got some good vibrations. Actually, that 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 whole album. I was telling somebody yesterday. Um, we gave a copy to uh, the Emotions because we, when they did that gig with us last year, right? Yes. We were doing radio stations, and so we gave them a copy, and. Uh, Wanda and Wyan. Wyan, Wanda's daughter, sounds just like Wanda. She's an amazing, talent, great writer as well, carrying on the legacy. And, and Wanda's like, man, Mary Louisa. I mean, we, we didn't know Louisa sang like that. And, and also, you know, uh, Wayne Vaughn, who wrote Let's Group, they're married, Wanda and Wayne. Hey, Wanda and Wayne. I never, <laughs> I never paid attention to that. Wanda and Wayne. And she said, yeah, he, we were, he was barbecuing over the weekend. And, just playing the CD and everybody said, is that the new Earth with a Fire album? Mm. Said, no, that's, that's LDO. Yeah, the, the title track has that Let's Groove kind of feel to it. Right, absolutely. Accidentally on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. You know what that was? Is actually, um, that was a song that we had submitted to the Japanese for a commercial that they did. And then so we just took that track and made it a whole song because it was just, it was just like a 60 a 60 minute a 60 second little spot so we just took it and she came up with the other melody and we just stretched it out and made it and made it a whole song i really like the jimmy smith like organ that you got going yeah. on yeah that's yeah. funky yes i love yeah it. i still got my b3 out there and she turns it into the shrine most people have no <laughs> idea what it is because you know they close right so she's got awards and flowers so you don't know what the hell it is <laughs> and also the sax and flute really cool that was both awesome. ronnie isn't that ronnie funny because on uh what's uh steven's song brother to brother brother to brother my brother actually wrote that and, and played everything on it the only thing I, the, that was that he didn't play was hubert laws on flute and me on the move but he did everything else but ironically enough on into the journey 
that's Ronnie playing the flute and the sax because I didn't know, I, I forgot what Ronnie told me, his first instrument was actually the flute and Hubert was his teacher. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> but him, him and Hubert sound the same on the flute. I mean, he's, sure he, he can't go all the way like Hubert, but then again, Hubert doesn't play sax, so. Yeah. And then the version of Reasons, great keys. Love the sax on that too. Andre yes. Delano. Yes, he's amazing. Yeah, that he's a uh, one of them St. Louis boys like Charlie Parker. Twilight. Twilight's kind of like uh, an epic, you know, in a way. I mean, it's got that jazzy feel and flow, and and I really like the uh, breaks too. I mean, it takes you places. That that was yes, this nice one. Dynamics. But tell, tell him how that happened. He don't tell him. Well, it was so ironic because uh, me and my girlfriends would go to karaoke. So I I asked Larry. I said, Larry, can you just throw me a rough track of Twilight World? Just a rough track, drums or whatever chords, and I'll take it to karaoke with me on the on the disc. And then our Japanese friend was here with us. He said. Why you want to do that? He said, why don't you just record a song for you and put it on the album? I said, I just want it for karaoke. He said, no. He said, just do the track for, you know, for Larry's album. I said, okay. End of story. And you know what? Almost, <laughs> I, I, I think it is 100% of every male that I've given the CD to or that we talk to, they don't give me one. We love it. It's all the bomb. But their favorite is Twilight World. Every man, every male, that's the favorite. And I was talking to Ralph Johnson, and he was like, no, he, he could not believe that I programmed those and played those string, all the string parts. Right. And I did the horns, but we added real horns on top. But he, he thought it would be the other way around. He said, I would think maybe, I thought the horns were programmed, but the strings were real. I said, well, it was some doing. I worked yes. my butt off on that. Amazing. Even slipped some kalimba in on that one too. Oh yeah. And then you said that. Uh, so you've obviously you've heard the original, right? Um, Twilight World. My sweet that, sister. Who did the original? Oh, you didn't know. You didn't know. Uh, swing out, See, that, sister. That's funny. That's the same thing. <laughs> oh. by our engineer that I've been with since. When I was 20, Chris Brunt from Nottingham, England, that worked with Quincy and Stevie and all that, I told you, the amazing guy, uh, physicist, uh, pilot, uh, played baritone sax, so he knows what it is to be a musician, and he's like a brother to us. Actually, we live where we live now because he let us use his house for our wedding uh, party, but when he heard the song, same thing, he, he didn't know, and he said, well, maybe... If you maybe need one more section or something, and then we played him the original. He went, wow, and Louisa really went in on that vocal because on the original, where I'm doing, and I'm doing the Moog solo, they did a waka tika waka tika waka tika because it was the 80s. It was a group called Swing Out Sister. I remember the group. Yes. Right. Well, look up their their version. It was really nice. But I said, we, we made it something just a little bit different because where they went disco, we went swing jazz and uh, and everybody her vocals she's a little thing but she sounds like a big thing yeah so you get your barry white on kind of on uh walk on water it's kind of like a more be, that would be barely white <laughs> <laughs> more like a, sp a spiritual uh, version of barry white on that one walk on the, our, our dear girlfriend lynn davis who sang with george duke and everyone we were talking to her the other night she said oh my god that album and louisa your voice and Larry, he talked to call, everybody called That's George Duke Big Daddy. You know, Big Daddy would go, oh, you know, that would he would love that song. Walk on the water, live in the sky. And actually, our, our other great friend, Preston Sturges, the son of the famous movie mogul Preston Sturges, back in the 40s, that did all those great comedies with Barbara, Barbara Stanwyck, Stanwyck and who's the guy? I always go Marilyn to Marilyn Monroe. No, uh, uh, Harry. Uh, Peter Stewart. Peter Stewart. He wrote the lyrics for that. His son. Yeah. His yeah. Son. Because, you know, uh, his dad, the Preston Sturgis Sr., actually passed away, I think, when Preston was only four years old or something like that. But Preston, extremely talented. And uh, he wrote a couple of books. 
we went up to the big bookstore on Sunset for the signing. And so he does music. He wrote a couple of songs for uh, David Lee Roth, Sensible Shoes and something else. But uh, plays guitar, a uh, great writer, and also writes movies and scripts. And yeah, I wish I could take uh, credit for those lyrics on there, but I'm going to pick. Oh. I'm going to keep it, keeping it real. <laughs> <laughs> One of my other of huge heads fitting in there. Can we fit? Oh, yeah, you fit. no problem. Okay. Wow. <laughs> One of my other favorite songs is uh, Sacred Soul. Wow, that, that's pretty. See, again, you know what's so deep about well, I remember I told you I called her church lady. Remember Dana Carver's church lady with the dance? Um, <laughs> gonna be Satan. Uh, she actually named that song before Stanley and I even recorded it. You know, it's so ironic that when uh, Larry started on the track, it was, you know, just, uh, it was missing. Stanley's playing, but he just did a, a rough demo of it. And we were, I was in this room when he was on the phone with Stanley and I just heard God's voice. He said, call it sacred soul. And I said, Lord, sacred soul. He said, yes, my son. And um, from there, I just heard that it was, God was telling me it's going to heal people when they hear it. And let me tell you, I had quite an experience because we knew some gentleman, he was a police officer, had back issues. He went to Israel. And in my mind, when the Larry wrote Sacred Soul, I saw Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's how I saw it. And this gentleman told me, you know, when I was in Israel, I, 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 I was playing you guys C CD. He said, guess where I was at? I said, where? In the Garden of Gethsemane. Get out. I don't even remember that. I was, I was, was going, oh, my gosh. What? I'm blown away. Who, um, that old, the older black guy? The, yeah, that was the oh, cop. Oh, Greg, Greg's, Greg's friend. friend. Wow. Yeah. yeah, and he was having back issues. He said, yeah, you know, I was, was not feeling well, but when I was playing you guys CD, I was there. And he said, and I felt the healing coming. We've heard body. that from several people that, you know, they were playing and then they felt heat, warmth going through their body. I'm like, wow. He said the record wouldn't move. The, the record, or when the, the song was playing, Sacred Soul, it wouldn't go to the next track. It kept, as playing they, it. It kept going it back to the same to thing for, for, for us, for me too. When I, I had a rough, a rough copy of the album, above, you know, and trying to figure out the, the, what do you call it? The, the order, the song or title order. And one night she said, "All right, I just want to hear the whole album," and it wouldn't go. It kept repeating that song over and over again. Over and over again. Wow. Yeah. But needless to say, the bass is great in it, and the kalimba is great. Um, nice. Yeah, nice I had cool. the track, and then uh, uh, we went right up the street to Stanley's place, and. Uh, so we cut the first half in, in his studio with him and I trading with Moog and electric bass. And then we went out in the hallway with his upright bass and me with the with the kalimba and cut the, the rest of it. And was, remember, I love the end when me and Stanley and I are looking at each other. And I said, you good? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. Wow. Well, thank you. Yes, thank you. And finally is a, a nice ballad. It's not, it's called Finally, but it's not the last track. Um, slow Burner, kind of heard little bits, made me think of uh, something like Be Ever Wonderful, you know, I could feel that kind of uh, lineage, you know, if you will, in a way. That's funny. That was featuring B. Lloyd Taylor and him and James Ingram grew up together. I didn't know that until. You know, I thought of James Ingram, yeah two yeah. peas in a pod and his wife Debbie was here and uh, B. Lloyd and, and James were outside on the balcony uh, outside on the porch talking and Debbie said those two they're like gasoline and fire <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and ironically enough they sound uh, so much so alike, much alike. Mm -hmm. and then if you throw in uh, what's his name uh, McDonald uh, Michael, Michael McDonald. McDonald the three of them It'd be like the three tenors or the yeah. three Tito's. Yeah. Um, yeah, all three of those uh, that that's saying it's, it's amazing. But he was on being, being like, you got to sing this 
think <laughs> is not what he said. But and uh, so actually, that was uh, James and Beloit and Louisa doing the backgrounds. James didn't even sing the lead. That was Gerald Beloit McCulley. Taylor and Gerald McCulley yeah. singing the, all the backgrounds. Uh, yeah, that was something. Beloit Taylor, what a voice. Yeah, it's funny because I did think of like a just once kind of thing. Also, yeah, wow. Yeah. And you know, a lot of people said that's that that could be the next, the new wedding song. Yeah. Because and then our friend um uh, from Colorado, Trenton Bird, yeah, he wrote actually that. wrote that. The him and him and I wrote it. Yeah, both and, and and but he wrote the lyrics. And I thought that was brilliant, you know. Finally, when we turn old turn gray to turn Don't old and turn to gray yeah. with appreciation, I'll uh, I remember I'll, that I remember day. the day when you came my way. <gasps> Finally. Finally. Yeah. Yeah, that was Good stuff, Maynard. Yeah. Yeah. Then you, you you close it up with Madness, which is, you know, kind of a... This one again. It's got, um, well, stop provoking. Um, and it's got a little bit of a rocky edge at parts of it, which is different flavor from the rest of the record. That's what the cook ordered. Yeah. When, when, that was when, the last she, thing. When she had it, she's like, I want, I want it like rock and roll. I'm like, right, okay, cool. We can do that. That was the last one. I mean, he was finished with the album. I said, Larry, I hate to break it to you. Yeah, and I hated to hear it. I said, there's one more song. One more song. Uh, I said, you have to because uh, spiritually. But it's was, been seven years. Like, spiritually, you know? it's like, you know, it was a thing that had to be done. And I was trying to be obedient about it. And so, you know, Larry said, well, let me hear it. And um, and I said, it, at least the album it's going to fit the album because it has a little bit of everything for everybody to hear. And it's a message song. And it's so relevant because of what's going on today in yeah. today's world that is, you know, a giving a message to the world. Unfortunately, it's going to remain relevant. Yeah. I was going to say, it's if anything, it's more relevant than it was when you put it out. Absolutely. Because, yeah. you know, it, she's a, a, a dream sleeper writer. You know, that's right. For, for years, she had the old Sony Walkman, and she'd get something and she'd disappear and go out of the living room four in the morning, put down the melody, then we work on it. But, you know, she's like, God gave me these lyrics three nights in a row, and part one, two, and then we sat down at the table and rearranged them and the whole thing. But is that the word? Politician. Humility is what our world leaders need. There is so much greed, no accountability. Hello world, get down on our knees and pray to overcome all the struggles we face today. It's a sign of the times in a war, in a lie. And it's always a freaking war. And most of the time it is a lie. Yeah. And that stuff that's going on in Syria is like, really? You know, and you go all the way back to the Holocaust and the people who see that could never happen in today's modern world. Really? Now. What's going on now? It, it, we don't even know. It might be way worse. Yeah. Than the Holocaust. Well, also, that's just a blink of an eye in time when the Holocaust oh, was. People don't yeah. realize 60 years ago or whatever is nothing. Right. Yeah. You know, like I said, I, I said, like I think I told you, the first two years of my life was on the farm, right? I told you. With Nana, Papa, from Calabria, Ala Calabria, so that means hard head, from Calabria down in the boot. Italy looks like a boot. It's down in the boot, Calabria. So they came out there. Yeah, he came to New York and then I guess migrated to, right away to Colorado, did the farm and sent for Nana. And it was amazing. But even then, they knew prejudice. You know, WAP, you know what a WAP is? Yes, unfortunately I do. Yeah, yeah. without papers, you know, for, for the Italians or whatever. Derogatory, so yeah. My mom told me way back then when, when I was a little older then, no, even back then she said, some of the surrounding farms they were they were tripping you know they made their daughters walk all, all the way up, out of the way they they were scared that their daughter walks too many times in front of the, the Durandos their daughter could have, end up marrying an Italian oh god forbid <laughs> yeah. so she was already familiar with it but like I said ironically enough when they bought the house we moved to suburbia Denver in the neighborhood it was gorgeous we had Dark skinned black people, we had light skinned black people, we had Asians, we had white people, we had like all a, Hispanic. Like a utopia, Larry. Yeah, exactly. Right. The, the, the lady across the street where I took the piano lesson, it was so, so, so great, but it seems like we are unevolving. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, everybody, people are so angry and so full of hate now. It's just crazy. And that's why what she, we wrote, and we really um, put that under the microscope when we said, wrong is right, right is wrong. What the hell is going on is what she had originally. And I said, no, let's, let's keep it even cleaner. What in hell is going on? They're like, wow. And consequently, you know, that's the, I mean, the lyrics to the stuff is in the album. But that's the only one, as you notice, when you lift the CD out, the lyrics are in the in, in the, where the, the the tray, and uh, you know a lot of people. Actually, there's a, a band in Macedonia that cut even more of a rock version of it. I'll see if I can uh, find that and I'll send it to you. Yeah, please do. I'd be curious to hear it. Yeah. Yeah, they did a good job. Yeah. But, but yeah, you know, so you did your homework. Yes. Hey, you know, I would say. The only upside of all that kind of madness is is that uh, it's inspiration for artists to create great works that speak some sense of it all and, and try to yeah. make for a better future. So we wrapped up um, the madness um, into the journey. And I wanted to uh, throw out there, as long as Louise is here with us, what is uh, something about uh, Larry that... Um, we might not know or might surprise us. A lot of people know he's a funny guy. No, most people don't. Most people don't. Well, yeah, he is one. hilarious. That, that's the one. Most people, when they meet me, they go, well, we thought you were the quiet, stuck-up one. Yeah, they, <laughs> they think he's too serious. Well, I guess I, I'm too comfortable because when it comes to our friends, he's so funny. Looks ain't everything. <laughs> ba -dum -ba -dum. <laughs> well, he's He's got a great big part because, you know, when they look at Larry Dunn on those um, Earth, Wind & Fire albums, he looks serious and mean, you know. That's the rock and roll picture. The, the rock and roll pictures, right? Everybody's got to do that. But, yeah, the serious. <laughs> <laughs> the gangster lean. Um, but he is, um, he's a beautiful spirit. He's got a big heart. Hey, keep talking. I need some music. <laughs> He got a big heart. Um, he's he gives. He's a giver, and he's always. Um, I love the fact that he loves God. He always put God first in everything that he's, he does. So, and he's a fun guy. So we, him and I, we always do everything. Uh, together and I, I support him in everything that he does. When we're not doing stuff that together and everything that he does on his own, I'm there to support him and he does the same for me. And, and he'll do it for anybody. That's not what anybody. I love about not him. Not anybody. Okay. Or just select Most them. people and animals. Yeah, most people and animals. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, did, how did you guys meet? Pardon? How did you guys meet? Um, how did we meet? And you know what's so ironic? We're talking about the horn uh, section, guys. It was Romley Davis, who was one of the horn section trumpet, trumpet player. One of two trumpets. And he was um, buddies with one of my roommates. So he would come over and um, my girlfriend said, oh, uh, have you met Romley? I said, no, he said, you know, he plays with Earth, Wind, and Fire. He's one of the horn players. I said, okay. So he came over one day. He said, you know, would you guys be interested in doing some seamstress work? I said, what? And I said, okay. So how much are you offering? He said, they offering is fifteen dollars. I said, per hour. He goes, no, fifteen dollars flat. And I said, oh, that's so cheap. But I was at that time, I was a starving student. And I said, well, you know what? Let's go. So he took us. He said, we'll go and we do the work. And he said, I might introduce you to some of the guys. I was a kid then. I was about 14. We went and we did the work. And then when uh, we were at the Earth, Wind, and Fire studio, uh, Maurice had right on the, it's called the complex. So when, um, we were finished with the work, then we see little by little the guys coming out from the back from recording. I believe they were recording. 
So they came out to the reception area and so Romley introduced me to all the guys, minus Maurice. Maurice wasn't there. But um, then I see Larry coming out at the last minute and he was in a reception area and he was looking for something. He was under the table looking for something. And Romley said, hey, hey, Larry, I want you to meet my friend. And he's just looking at, he said, are you all right, dude? What, what you what you looking for? He said, for something. And then when he came out, I saw him, he introduced us. It's like, I eyes hit. And it's like something just hit me. I went, okay. I know I'm too, I'm young and stuff, but there's something about him that I really dig. I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> and I'm young, I'm young too. <laughs> And something in my spirit said, I I, I think I'm, I'm in love with him, you know? Wow. And I told my girlfriend, I said, you know what? There's something about him. I can't figure out. It's not about the celebrity status, but something about the spirit. And she said, I said, I think I'm in love with him. She said, you say that about every guy. I said, I never say that I'm in love with him. I said, I like them, but this is different. I'm in love with him. I said, but I'm too young. I'm too young. And um, so I asked Romilly, I said, is he married? He said, yes, he is. I said, well, that's it for me. I said, I'm too young anyway. But from that day on, him and I became best friends, best, real good friends for years till I became of age. And at that time, Larry was going through a certain situation in his marriage. And I had a boyfriend at that time. And, and he even spoke to my boyfriend because he was not a good guy, but he ministered to him and told him that he had a good girl and for him to treat me right. But uh, from that moment on, Larry always been so sweet and always ministered to me and always, um, what's the word? Counseled me, you know, just always supported me and never tried anything. You want to come in, honey? Because I'm fine. That's what I'm fine. <laughs> there he is. And he was fine. And he is fine. Yes. My girlfriend, we did um, a radio show yesterday uh, talking about the women in the industry. And one of uh, the lady, uh, the radio uh, uh, host. host, she was funny. She said, you know, you know, your husband is fine. I said, yes, he is fine. Yeah, I know. I know, girl. Yes, he is fine. <laughs> <laughs> and here I am. And here he is. <laughs> Who used to say that? Don't hate me because I'm beautiful. Beautiful, yeah. Larry. Nah, surely I guess. Oh, gosh. He's such a hammy. <laughs> uh, Scott, he's a he, he's, You're amazing. He does his homework, see? Yeah. So, uh, what are you up to now? What can people expect from both of you in the near future? Well, you know, we're still doing, uh, right now, we're doing Larry Dunn's anthology of EWF. Um, Great band. We got some amazing, amazing singers and musicians, and it's just uh, awesome. Here, Wilson and I've been with since I was 11 years old, still with us. We've got uh, Ty Fleming on drums. We got, of course, Louise is the only female. All her through the fire music. Um, Master Edwards on vocals, Procter Monell III on vocals, Howard Johnson from So Fine Fame, uh, Leslie Smith, who's been with. Uh, um, Sergio Mendez and Phil Collins. Phil, Phil, Phil Collins, everybody. Uh, we got actually two guitarists that uh, interchange, but I'm going to get to the point where I can pay them both. Uh, Geo Evans and Daryl Crooks. Uh, horns, we've got Keith McKelly on sax, unbelievable. Uh, Dwayne Benjamin, trombone. Jamil Williams, trumpet. Michael Hunter, trumpet. Um, who else? I don't leave anybody out. Okay, we got drums. I, I said all the singers, singers, right? I said all the singers. Yeah, singer. And you, so, me. And then we, we'll be looking for uh, a percussionist. Yeah. Like, well, we actually have a, a lady that, well, I'm just waiting to get enough money to pay all these people because we got a <laughs> big band. Yes, we do. But and they're we'll, amazing. We're finally, well, we've been for you forever, but we're finally going to get to it and complete her first solo project, which is going to be awesome. Yes. And uh, we got, we've got more gigs coming up this year and um, just a lot of different things. 
Bucks. Hey, what do you think uh, your record might come out this year or next year? Or? No, it'd probably be next year. You know, I'm hoping. You know what? I'm thinking about maybe we're, we're, you know, release doing a, a, single. a re release a single, single this year. So we're right. working on that. It's going to be great. And maybe we'll do like an EP. So I'm hoping that we could just finish this before the end of the year. That we can finish. To to release it for the next year. On Into the Journey, it took us seven years. Yes. We didn't feel bad, though, because uh, Stevie took the same on his album. Yeah. And I said, he's got a little bit more money than we do. Yeah. So people <laughs> say, why don't you just uh, do get favors? I said, no, I don't like to do that. I mean, you know, we could do barter system or whatever, but we like to make sure every musician that is on there gets paid exactly you know plus it's a good it's a good idea for all the people in the music and to know you can do favors and all that different stuff but be careful i said two things i've always found in life the best way to keep friends and or family friends and family is get the business up front and out the way That's mm -hmm. right. and i remember seeing an interview with jimmy and terry years ago i'm talking about 15 20 maybe whatever and they were they said something very wonderful they said look there's two different components to what we're into. The music business, that's music and business. So, you know, you, you, you take care of both and then you always, you know, you, you, your friends will stay your friends, you know? Because, and then, like I said, even on a business tip, you think about it, if a guy plays for you for free, the new uh, Scott Goldfine album, and you got Larry Dunn played on there for free, and then your album goes number one, trip group platinum all over the world and i'm like hey man remember i played for free i think i should have at least 85 percent of your publishing right <laughs> you're like hell no so yeah always remember that people get your business up front and out the way and that way you can maintain relationships forever especially for the young budding musicians out there exactly oh absolutely yeah. i don't know about you but do you see any great bands? I mean, there's, I mean, you can, off the top of your head, okay, Bruno Mars. Uh, yeah, Bruno Mars is um, my favorite. And that's it. <laughs> there's, there's a couple of good rock bands and stuff. But overall, remember back in our day, we used to have Battle of the Bands because there was so many bands. Oh, it was crazy. It was crazy. Even yeah, if you go back, go back and look at, um, you know, a chart from like, you know, what was being played on the radio back then. And every one of them is like a band that was developed, that had their own sound, that had some great songwriting. Yes. Absolutely. That's what we miss today. Before uh, I shut it down, what um, is there any message that you want to get out to, you know, your fans through all the years, Larry, before we say goodbye? Yeah. Hey, Larry Dunn, I just want to say thank you all so much for your faithful uh, – support and all these years of supporting us and and uh buying and, and enjoying the music and uh like i say jokingly but it's so true if it wasn't for you people we'd be a legend in our own room or in our own mind and so uh it's 50 50 we do what we do and thank god you all do what you do and it's you you are the ones that have made this legacy for earth when and fire continue on and Hopefully now you stay on board and you can go to LarryDunnMusic.com and you can see what uh, my lovely wife and I and the family and all of us are doing. And if we come to your town, please come out and see us. And uh, if, if you want to get any of our product, you can also go to that LarryDunnMusic.com and it's a PayPal thing. If you put a note on there for us to do it, we will do, we'll sign it for you and it will be sent right to your doorstep. All wow. right, and thank you so much, Mr. Goldfine. Thank you so much. Now, now go find your dinner. <laughs> <laughs> thank you both. Thank Great you to so meet much. you also, and uh, continued uh, success with whatever you're doing, and um, thank you so much for your time and for all the uh, contributions you've made to our musical pleasure. Thank, thank you so you. much. God bless you all and your families. And your family, yes. Thank you, and blessings to all the people who are watching in. God bless. Thank you. Okay, well, with that, it's time to wrap up this edition of Truth and Rhythm. A huge thanks once again. I cannot say it enough to my special guest, Larry Dunn, the keyboarding cornerstone of one of the all-time greatest R&B funk bands, Earth, Wind, and Fire. Also, thanks to his lovely wife, Louisa. 
And sincere thank you to you, the viewers and supporters of Truth and Rhythm. Thank you so much. Spread the word. Be sure to subscribe and also get your friends and family to subscribe. We need that support. Keep the funk alive. Keep the musicians going. Keep the legacies flowing. Let's support each other. And I want to hear from you. So drop me an email at scottg at funkandsift.net. Let me know what you like, what you don't like, who you might want to see on the show. And give me all that good feedback. Thrive on that. So with that, until next time, this is Scott, Dr. GX Goldfine, as always, saying keep on vibrating to the rhythm of the one.